Good afternoon, everyone. So we have a quite a few people already online, so we're not really gonna wait after two. So we're gonna start right now. Um, thank you for joining us for another webinar. We at PSS are dedicated to stay connected to our community for providing by providing necessary information as we are trying to navigate these unprecedented um, time. Today, we're going to discuss advances in dementia caregiving. Our first guest is Jed Levin. Jed is the president and CEO of Karen Kai, a trusted community resource for dementia care and information, where he has worked for 30, for 30 years. So Jed, I'm just, you're gonna be on mute now. Good afternoon. Hi. And, oh, great, thank you, Shana. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. And, um, you know, thank you for joining us. And I'm uh, assuming that most of you are family caregivers uh, for people with dementia. And uh, I imagine that there are some professionals in here as well. So you're, you're all welcome. And I'm uh, going to talk to you this uh, afternoon. You can go to the next slide. Just about um, the issues of, of caring for somebody with Alzheimer's disease. I think many of you are familiar with this, these figures. Uh, this is a very um, huge issue. I think it's uh, you know, uh, one of the major public health issues um, facing us in the United States. Um, you can see the, the, the numbers over close to 6 million people live with the disease. Um, it certainly is a disease primarily of older adults. However, not everybody who has it is older. Um, perhaps one to 4% of people are under the age of 60 or 65. And it also unfortunately is the sixth leading cause of death. Um, but what I really wanna focus on today is kind of the experience of the caregiver. And we can go to the next slide. Shana, thank you. And um, there's a book called I Still Do. Living and Loving with Alzheimer's by uh, a photojournalist named jo Judith Fox. And she describes it this way. She says, Alzheimer's doesn't announce itself with an ache, a pain, a limp. It rolls in like a fog. It dissipates. It leaves space for denial. And I think many people, when they begin to suspect that something is wrong with somebody's memory or how they're thinking or how they're managing the daily tasks that we all kind of do for ourselves, personal care and personal business. Um, uh, it's easy to kind of make up uh, excuses or thinking he's under a lot of stress or something's really difficult in the family. Um, but eventually people come to the reality, uh, to the realization that there really is something wrong and people go for a diagnostic workshop uh, or diagnostic workup. And um, next slide. And because this disease is one that takes um, many years, uh, it's generally slow and insidious in terms of its onset and the progression of symptoms, although it's highly variable. And she describes, um, uh, Judith Fox describes uh, the impact of this disease um, this way. She says, these are some of the things her husband used to do, fly a plane. He was a surgeon. He consulted worldwide, headed a university and medical center, uh, hit four holes in one, which is amazing, and played on the same basketball team as Bob Cousy. And now he can't find his way to and from an unfamiliar bathroom. He can't work the coffee maker. He can't play golf or remember something I told him two minutes ago. So I think at the heart of what happens uh, with um, uh, the, the, when someone is diagnosed is that there is a, an emotional response of uh, disbelief and I, shock. Uh, I remember one of my patients or clients in an early stage group, members of our early stage group many years ago, who said when she was told by her diagnosing physician at, at NYU, she said, I'm sorry, you must be mistaken. I can't possibly have Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it was not good news for her. And I think the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that both the individual with the disease has 
and the kind of fear of the future. How can I do this? I think for the both for that individual, but especially for the caregiver, um, it feels so daunting and so overwhelming. And yet, let me tell you that we've learned so much about providing really good support and care for that individual with the disease, but importantly also for the family caregiver. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And let me put a parallel in here. Hold on, hold on a second. Uh, um, I think what we are all experiencing now with this trauma of the pandemic, the fear of not knowing how long it's going to last, um, the sense of helplessness in the face of it, um, the disbelief. Um, can this really be happening? Our world is changing so drastically. I think it's very similar to what happens when there's a diagnosis of dementia or any real trauma. And so if we look at, at Alzheimer's and other dementias um, as a real trauma to our, uh, our life, it changes the way we think about the future. It changes the way uh, kind of it rewrites our life script in some ways. Um, but again, I think the kind of resilience and strength and resourcefulness that we're seeing now uh, with people stepping up, you know, listening to the authorities in terms of, of what they're recommending about preventing COVID-19. Um, I think we learned a lot uh, and we can learn a lot from caregivers who have uh, tapped into their own resilience and their own strengths. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's go to the next slide. I think the other important thing to keep in mind, I love this slide, is that uh, the cognitive changes, the way we think, the way we remember, the way we function um, with Alzheimer's and other dementias, is not an on-off switch. It's more like a dimmer switch. So there are times that things really get a little bit better, um, look like somebody's functioning pretty well, and the next day they might not be functioning as well. They might be a little more foggy, a little more confused, uh, and it goes up and down, and there are changes within a day and within a week. And so um, I think that's, that's important to keep in mind. Next slide. The other thing I like to remind uh, family members is that uh, one, after, you know, after you've gotten the diagnosis, um, you might want to get a second opinion. This is a serious disease and you want to make sure that I always recommend that people go to one of the major academic medical centers where they really specialize in diagnosing um, uh, cognitive disorders. Um, certainly we have a wealth of them uh, in New York City and you can call our helpline. We can give you information about where to go uh, for that diagnostic opinion. But importantly, in the very begin from the very beginning, you cannot do this alone. This disease is going to be bigger than any one caregiver. And uh, social supports are critical, important, just as they are during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you can't, you know, I know we're all isolated in our homes, um, but there are ways of connecting and getting supports, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and for Alzheimer's disease, um, Certainly medical treatment is, is limited. We have ways of um, treating some of the symptoms, uh, but we don't have a disease modifying drug yet. Um, I'm optimistic that we'll get there sometime. I can't tell you when. Um, and, but we, as I said earlier, we know so much about caring for the person with, with dementia and especially for the caregiver. Um, so let's move on, next slide. It's important to recognize that you, the caregiver, are experiencing uh, very profound changes as well. And very um, your response to uh, your new role and having to take care of somebody. And I think all of these are now um, exacerbated or um, in, uh, they are greater now because we are caring for somebody often who you are living with 24 hours a day and you can't get away, they can't get away to a program, a day program or something like that. Um, so the emotional responses, it's not uncommon to feel more anxious, to be socially isolated. Friends and family often don't uh, interact as much, um, to feel guilty, to feel anger, uh, frustration and resentment. 
Um, stress uh, on, on the data shows us that stress is higher when compared to other caregivers. There is a grief response. And I think, again, this is part of the response that we're seeing with COVID-19 as well. Um, so there's a, there's a mourning of who that person was and a living with kind of a chronic sadness and always being waiting for that other shoe to drop, constantly being on high alert. And that alone has a um, negative effect on our health because all of these um, stress hormones are running through our body so often because you're constantly on, on edge and on high alert. Um, we know that the, the data shows us that about a third of uh, caregivers have symptoms of depression and uh, there's often family conflict and um, and people are also worried about finances as well. Let's move to the next slide. But it's not just an emotional and psychological impact on caregivers. There are true uh, physical impact on caregivers as well. They are experiencing more fatigue. And if it's one thing I hear from caregivers, and I've been doing this as you heard for many, many years, is that they're simply exhausted. They're drained. Um, they have no more to give. And so it's important to, that you kind of renew that source of, of uh, energy and, um, and strength. Um, we also know that there are reduced immune function and that there are new cases of hypertension and new heart disease, often disrupted sleep, more doctor visits, they're more likely to report that their health is fair or poor, more emergency room visits and hospitalizations. And unfortunately, older spousal caregivers who neglect their health might predecease the person with dementia. So it's in, in really um, uh, critical that people spend time uh, taking care of themselves. Uh, let's move on. And the common causes of stress, you know, it's not the cognitive symptoms that are, are, are um, so stressful, somebody not remembering something, it's the neuropsychiatric symptoms, the, the anxiety of the person with dementia, their increased agitation, their increased apathy or a seemingly lack of interest in activities. There might be some more aggressive behavior, the sleep disturbances certainly are, are difficult. I remember for my uncle who was caring for my aunt, um, getting up in the middle of the night was really hard and she would get up and try to wander out and he was and he was exhausted um a more a person with dementia might be more irritable and might wander out and we have a program which i'll talk to you about that manages that and also difficulty um you know using the bathroom and uh, inappropriate urinating and defecating is really difficult and troublesome mother Teresa, who many of you recognize uh, has a wonderful quote. She says, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Sometimes I wish God didn't have so much confidence in me. And I think family caregivers feel that way, that how much more can I take? Um, it's, it's such a monumental job uh, for, for individuals, which is why I say you can't do this alone. Get professional support, get professional help, reach out to friends, reach out to clergy, reach out to your community, reach out to family. Um, I think that'll be uh, very helpful. Let's go to the, uh, the next slide. Um, and I think, you know, we're all experiencing social isolation now. Um, and the loneliness, the lack of contact with other people is different from enjoying solitude. Um, loneliness is isolating, it's empty feeling, um, it's deadening, and it is something I think that, uh, and, and we're feeling this also, we feel it as an Alzheimer's caregiver, and now it's being intensified by this staying at home order and limiting um, physical contact with other people. But there are ways that you can make contact that are not physical but virtual, like you're doing this afternoon, that I think are, are very, very helpful. Um, next slide. Um, 
I think one of the common feelings for caregivers is just there's so damn much to do because now you have to do everything. If your wife did all the shopping, cooking, and she might have managed all the finances, and now you have to do everything. And caregiving is, uh, you know, sometimes there's, it's tedious. Um, it's, you know, not, not often the, <laughs> the most fun thing to do. And it's harder to do when you're um, exhausted. A colleague of mine, Olivia Ames Hoblitzel, who's an author and a Buddhist um, teacher, um, and was married to a Buddhist uh, teacher as well, uh, wrote a book about her experience caring for her husband. And she says, I was swamped under the weight of what needed to be done because he was no longer able to carry his weight. Everywhere I looked, things were crying out for attention. The garden was unweeded, repairs were needed, there was a rip screen and so forth. Next slide. Another caregiver who um, I knew very well, Susan Miller, uh, who cared for her husband, Don, who was diagnosed early at age 55. She used uh, the experience to write a book of poems. Uh, continue, um, next slide. And she says, and I think many of you might have felt this, I think someday I will lose my mind before he loses his. Um, and she had, she had a sense of humor, but it was, there's a lot of truth in that, in that uh, sentence as well. Next slide. So I think it's important for us to frame this discussion in understanding that what many of the feelings and many of the emotional responses that we're experiencing as um, caregivers for a person with dementia is that we're really experiencing grief. We are mourning the person who was in some ways. We're mourning the um, death of the relationship or the change in the relationship or the, the relationship that was is no longer. And with all grief, it takes time. And there is no timeline to how to um, accommodate it. Um, let me tell you that my experience shows me that if families get help, family caregivers get help, and are able to deal with their emotional experience, um, they come to accept the changes. Um, and it's much easier, it's much easier on them once they've accepted those changes versus the unrealistic hope that things are going to get better. And if he only tried harder, he could really, you know, do that uh, activity um, or make that cup of coffee or whatever it might be. And you can come to some resolution and uh, still have all of the feelings, but the feelings are not going to be as, um, they're not going to control you in the same way. Um, let's move on next. And with Alzheimer's disease, um, I think, and this is this comes from the work of of um, a Dr. Pauline Boss, uh, social worker who has really developed this the um, uh, concept of ambiguous loss and ambiguous grief. <sighs> Let me remind you that that uh, living with grief is exhausting. Living with this sense of chronic heavy, uh, chronic sadness is very heavy, um, and um, ambiguous grief is unsupported. Ambiguous loss because there's, the person hasn't died; they're still there, um, they're living, and they can still do many things and they can still participate in many things, but they're not who they were, um, and it's. Uh, very wearing on a family caregiver. And it's, there's no um, societal res response or support when somebody is going through this unresolved grief and this ambiguous loss. Uh, we don't hold a funeral for the person that was. There's no wake, there's no shiva, nobody's sending a sympathy card, nobody is sending flowers or, or food. Uh, so you feel very alone in the grief which is why connecting with other people through support groups and through some of the education programs that, that we provide and uh, some of our colleagues like PSS and NYU certainly provide are very important. Um, next, next slide, please. Dr. Uh, Boss describes unresolved grief as grieving without closure. 
and she the, she gives many examples of people who live with unresolved grief and, and ambiguous loss. Um, people who uh, dealt with uh, soldiers who are missing in action, or family members uh, who move from one country to another, and there's a whole family left behind uh, that you're not seeing as much and you're not in contact with as much. Um, so uh, let's move on to the next slide. And at the heart of this concept of ambiguous loss and ambiguous grief is the sense of absence and presence and this, this dichotomy that the individual is physically here, but psychologically absent in the way that they were. They're not the same person. Now, what one of the basic principles of how caring kind does our work is, is to recognize the sense of enduring self of the individual with dementia. Um, and that that person is still capable of engagement and pleasure and emotional connection, uh, even through the very advanced stages. It might take a little more um, creativity to connect with that individual, but um, they're still there. Uh, I hate when people say that it's a loss of self. It's I think the self remains intact and endures. Uh, it's up to us to be able to connect with that individual. I think it's very demeaning to say that that there's a loss of self. But nonetheless, the individual is here, but not here in the same way. And I think for those of you who are married to the spousal relationship, and even if you have a close relationship with a parent that you talk to every day or you're living with, or another relative, um, because language is affected, the ability to communicate is affected, there is that loss of that daily dialogue, and that's very hard for, for individuals to do. You, you feel it, it in, intensifies the, the loneliness, I think. So Dr. Boss describes uh, the way to understand the ambiguity as a challenge, that we can live with it uh, if we use what she calls both and as part of our thinking. For instance, that the individual is both gone and still here. I can take care of both him and myself. I am both a caregiver and a person with my own legitimate needs. So balancing it and not always focusing on what that individual needs and what they are experiencing, but to um, use your needs and recognize your own needs as well. And the next slide has some other examples. I both wish it was over and wish that my relative keeps on living. I can go to the next slide. And I am both sad about my lost hopes and grieving the person that was, but uh, I can have dreams and be happy about some new hopes and new dreams. Um, so I think it's an, a, a helpful uh, approach to understanding this disease. Understanding your, not understanding the disease, but giving you a way of responding and understanding how to uh, balance uh, both your needs and the needs of your relative with dementia. Let's move on. Next slide. Where is the hope? Uh, you know, we, do, we don't have, research has not come up with a, a good medical answer yet, um, but I think there is hope. I think there's hope that uh, family members, family caregivers can survive this. I think there's hope that the person with dementia can um, experience um, pleasure and comfort and connection throughout the disease. Um, and the hope is in that you don't have to shoulder this alone. It's simply too much. So what we know about resilient caregivers is that they ask for help. They reach out, and certainly all of you who are on the call this afternoon and on the webinar can, can you know, you are getting information, you're getting support. Um, but we also know that it's important for you to take time for yourselves, even if it's only five or 10 minutes a day. Um, I think it's also important to stay in the present moment. 
uh, not forecast what's going to happen in the future or go go down that line uh, and to focus on care not cure I think cure is um, it's a great goal I'm not sure that we're going to make it for this generation of, of individuals with the disease um, but I think we do as I said earlier we do know so much so much about um, cure and I would also say the resilient caregiver practices self-care and I think that's very very important and one other slide uh, or one other uh, sentence um, or statement is that self-care is not selfish that you need to use the airplane model which is you know when when the uh, oxygen masks come down you need to put the mask on yourself and not on uh, uh, first and then on your person that you're caring for so resilient caregivers uh, practice healthy activities they breathe and i think it's important for us all to kind of take a moment and take a breath and i think especially in this pandemic environment i think it's also very helpful for us to remind ourselves to slow down because there's a sense of urgency and a sense of um, demand that everybody and, and fear and anxiety so simply reminding ourselves to breathe helps relax that and kind of centers us again exercise is critical moving whether it's walking or doing an exercise program on an app or if you go to the gym or if you you know play sports which we can't do at the moment uh, but i think um, there are ways to do all of this um, at home as well um, resilient caregivers take a moment to read and to uh, uh, and and to practice something that kind of centers ourselves, whether it's prayer or meditation or religious service. I think it's important. And resilient caregivers also practice acceptance and recognize that you did not cause this. And statements like "If only I had seen this happening," or "Why didn't he, you know, take better care of his, you know." diabetes uh, are not helpful sometimes things happen and we don't understand why and to reassure yourself that you're doing the best you can let's go to the next slide uh, resilient caregivers um, take accept all of their feelings both the loving ones and the not so loving ones and i think it's common for people to have moments of anger or distress um, and forgive yourselves for those feelings Cultivate patience with yourself and with the person with dementia. And know that resisting to feeling uncomfortable feelings creates more distress and more pain. And find opportunities for pleasure and joy in their lives. Um, let me uh, move on to the Gail, Gail Sheehy, who's written many uh, books. And uh, so she talks about caregiving and asks caregivers to pledge to do something personal something pleasurable for yourself every day for a week and just practice that that might be going to yoga or having coffee with a friend or having a glass of wine with a friend or swimming or knitting or whatever you like to do working on your car uh, i had a friend who uh, when she was caring for her husband she was faithful to her bowling league and that community was really important to her uh, other friends who chant who sang in, in choir and that community really and the act of singing um you know and again a lot of this we can't do in this environment at the moment um but also resting and taking a nap if, if that's what's pleasurable to you next slide uh, and think about what gives you pleasure um a cup of tea uh being with your grandchildren your your playing with your dog listening to rock music uh one half hour of jeopardy every night uninterrupted if you can get that for some people it's a real pleasure and for me it's my cat you can go to the next slide and you'll all see rocky who uh actually is uh, in the room with me at the moment um so i'm gonna skip the next slide and move on to live in two realities um I think this is really important. And again, this is Olivia Ames Hoblitzell and her um, experience, learning to let go and love at the same time and learning to separate and learning to take care of your own needs, but still take care of your relatives needs. Uh, it's a 
interesting balance, but it can happen and it does happen uh, with practice. And the last few slides, let's move on. Uh, Shana, how are we doing with time? Okay. We're pretty good, we're pretty good. <laughs> okay, good. Let me just move on. So finding support, and those of you who, who know Caring Kind as a resource, uh, you know, I'm, I'm delighted about that. I, I want to make sure that everybody knows of us as a resource. All of our services are free of charge to family caregivers. Um, we are a source of support of really good information and guidance and a, create a sense of community. It's been one of the hallmarks of what we do is try to create a sense of community for family caregivers. And we, hopefully all of that, once you find support and information and, and that sense of community helps a caregiver get in touch with, with their resilience. Next slide. So uh, the way most people connect with us is um, through the helpline, um, which is 646-744-2900. It's answered in English and Spanish. And uh, we have Chinese staff who answer in Mandarin and Cantonese. And we have a translation line that can translate into 200 different languages. And you can talk with a caring professional about your concerns, learn more about uh, the basics about memory loss and dementia and Alzheimer's and get connected and discover resources, both our internal resources and those of our more than 500 community partners. Next slide. Our social work services, provide short-term counseling and support for individuals and families by, by social workers, licensed social workers. And I had a talk with them yesterday and they're getting a lot of calls and the calls are so much more complicated now uh, dealing with the um, caring for somebody who is uh, often that they're living with 24 hours a day uh, without the supports of, of home care, of home care workers. Um, some families don't want a home care worker to come in. Other uh, people, a home care worker might be ill or is concerned about coming in and in inadvertently um, infecting uh, the person with dementia or the family caregiver. Um, family members often can't visit. Um, so we're practicing social distancing and it's really complicated. But we not only provide that emotional support and psychoeducation, we also provide information about practical things like uh, Medicaid planning, paying for long-term care, getting home care, looking, helping family members deal with conflict. And actually on April uh, 22nd, we're doing a meeting for professionals about uh, managing family conflict and dementia care. And then we'll be doing another meeting in May for family caregivers about recognizing um, that issue as well. And you can go to our website or call the helpline for more information about those um, programs. Next slide. Support groups are so critical and they are at the heart of what we do. Um, they are um, a place where family members can come together in a safe, welcoming environment to deal with their issues of being a caregiver. And almost every person who comes to a support group comes out of it saying, I'm not alone. It has that feeling that they're not dealing, they're connected to this community of caregivers and a sense of being understood in a deep and meaningful way that they have not been before. All of our group leaders are professionally trained and supervised, and we have many specialty groups. They're not uh, kind of, uh, they are groups for adult children, groups for uh, um, adult daughters, groups for spouses, uh, groups for English, Spanish, um, Chinese speaking uh, individuals. We do a group for LGBT um, individuals with the SAGE, and uh, so there are many specialty groups. We also have a group for people who are dealing with um, FTD, frontotemporal dementia, and a group for those who are dealing with uh, Lewy body dementia as well. Next slide. Ted Common had been in our groups for many, many years, caring for his wife for close to 20 years. And he said in that group, it preserved his sanity, countering aloneness and despair. The only place he could openly express his pain loss and anger, gaining valuable insights and direction. Next slide. Suzanne was a, also a, a woman who cared for her uh, husband. She had, he was diagnosed on their, the anniversary, their first anniversary. It was a second marriage for both. And um, she joined a support group and attended nearly every week for five years. 
She said, it's practical advice. Where do you buy supplies? How do you manage care? How do you deal with certain behaviors? It's also a place where you can talk about your feelings. So important. Next slide. Uh, another of our programs, which if everybody, is, if you're not already enrolled in this program, you should be. It's the Medic Alert Wanderers Safety Program. And you can call our helpline to find out more about it or go to our website, www.caringkindnyc.org. And you can enroll online. There is a charge for this uh, program, but if you can't afford it, uh, we do have some scholarship dollars so that everybody who needs the program can get it. Um, this is a program that addresses the issue of getting lost or wandering, and we work very closely with NYPD and have for close to 30 years, um, and we can provide su support for the, the family during the time that somebody is missing. I don't know if anybody on the call has ever experienced it, but it is a terrifying experience. And um, we have a very good track record. So people who are enrolled in the Medical Alert Wanderer Safety Program, we have a 99% success rate of finding them and returning them safely home. Um, let's move on. Uh, we also reach out to healthcare professionals and let those make sure that they are referring families to Caring Kind for information and support. And lastly, our um, next slide. Oh, that, that's a slide of, uh, yeah, keep, oh. I didn't send you the, the most up to date, but that's okay. Uh, th this is actually a slide of, somebody who helped found our organization, um, Jack Pollock with his wife, who he cared for uh, for about 17 years. And I think you can see the connection here. And Jack was instrumental in, in uh, he became a support group leader. He was a board member. Uh, he really used his experience to help others. Um, uh, that's a lovely photo. This is from 1989, it's a long time ago, but it's a very touching photo of, of uh, Jack and his wife. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, I just want to mention that we do have a program for people with the in the early or middle stages of the disease that's now actually been on hold because of the um, COVID-19 epidemic. Um, so uh, hopefully we can get back to it. It's held three days a week. There is a fee for attending. It's $85 per session and uh, attendees must be independent in activities of daily living and dressing and bathing and toileting. And you can always call the helpline for more information. Next in slide. And I just want to spend a, a, a moment talking about this. Um, and some of these are some of the principles that are good for caregiving at any time, but especially now when things are so much more difficult because People are trapped in the same home. Sometimes apartments can be very small. And if you have a home care worker, there are three of you there um, or more. But there, um, you know, we are a, a couple of things. One, that if you suspect that your relative with dementia has COVID-19, we are urging everybody in the Department of Health is to not take them to the hospital. Call your primary care physician, number one. Um, and don't take them to the hospital unless they're really in respiratory distress. But call your primary physician first. Um, and if the person with dementia is having, has been diagnosed with um, COVID-19, caring for that individual is really difficult. You know, my second bullet here is practice good hand hygiene, use 20 second songs. There's whole lists of songs that are that last 20 seconds or you can use the a chorus, make it fun. Uh, but sometimes you can't get your relative to, to uh, wash with soap. Hand sanitizer is just as good. And you can, you know, have them uh, use the hand sanitizer instead. Keeping a mask on somebody with Alzheimer's disease is going to be a challenge. Um, uh, and recognize that. And throughout this, you need to find time for yourself. As I said, previously, it's important to take care of yourself. There are lots of things that you can do for activities and engagement. And we are going to be posting next week um, a podcast from our Connect to Culture um, director about activities that are available online and ways of engaging somebody. And we'll be doing another um, uh, both podcast and webinar, I believe, 
about um, doing activities with your person. So certainly there's lots of music online or you can use an iPod. Using audio books or podcasts might be distracting for somebody and engaging. Uh, there are lots of exercise programs and activities for um, movement. Some people really enjoy word games or card games. I had people with dementia who loved doing worksheets, the kind of um, you know math worksheets or um, you know English exercises uh, that, and it was became their work, so to speak, and they really um, were engaged with it. Jigsaw puzzles at various levels you can get depending upon where your person is in the disease, can be engaging and fun. Um, or, as I mentioned, there are online cultural and activity resources. There are new apps and tools for helping the individual reminisce and to engage them. We have a tech fair and we'll be doing something with some of our tech partners who will be demonstrating some of these tools online uh, for, uh, for clients, for our families. And importantly, to break up the isolation, engage with family and friends, arrange for a FaceTime call or a Skype or a Zoom meeting. Uh, it really helps counter the sense of um, aloneness that we're feeling in our apartments and homes. Um, continue with faith practices. There are a lot of services online and meditation. There's some great apps that are available as well. Let me remind everybody the, the basics. Just eat good, good food, healthy food, and enjoy um, uh, you know, um, meal preparation with the person with dementia can be an activity as well. Sleeping well and getting good rest is important for you and for your person with dementia. And reach out for help. So our, our uh, you know, Caring Kind is available remotely. We're, we're, you, know, you can reach us at the helpline 646-744. 2900. Let me say that again. It's 646 744 2900. And you know, recognize that this will end and we'll all get through this. So, next slide. Uh, let me just say that we are 98% privately supported. So, there are lots of events and ways of, of supporting. And if you're able to, we'd appreciate uh, your support. Uh, continue. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide, these are just different resources and references. And um, you know, um, Shana, I will send you an, an updated slide deck to put online um, if you can. And uh, so next slide, just want to thank my colleagues who helped me with this. And, um, and it, uh, so thank you. I'm sorry we couldn't take questions, um, but we'll be doing questions later, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jed. Um, yeah, so um, we're going to take some question at the end. Um, if you, if anybody has any question, please add it to the Q&A box. I know some of you has, um, one person has waved. Ayala, you waved to, for us to, for, uh, for me to allow you to speak. So we're gonna just wait a little bit just to um, give the time to, for all the presenter to do their um, presentation. So next, we're going to have Dr. Milliman. Doctor, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I can hear you. OK, so um, you have a feedback. Can, can you hear me? Maybe I'll, I'll mute the um, Okay, um, uh, so I have, um, I have one question, um, Jed, maybe we can just answer that while um, Dr. Middleman is, um, it's. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you perfectly. Can't hear you though. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot hear me? No. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay perfect. perfect. Okay, so um, let me just quickly do the presentation. Um, Dr. Middleman is a researcher, professor, psychiatry and rehabilitative medicine at NYU of medicine and the director of NYU Alzheimer's disease and related disorder family support program. Trained in psychiatry and epidemiology, 
she has been developing and evaluating psychological intervention for people with cognitive impairment and their family member for three decades. Dr. Milliman was principal inv investigator um, of a Windows Mind control trial at, of, N of the NYU caregiver intervention funding for 20 years by the National Institute of Health, the result of which has been published widely. Again, welcome, doctor. Okay, I can't share my screen at the moment. Yes, I'm gonna stop now. You can't share your screen right now. Uh, I can't find the right thing to share. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, well, this is a very different presentation from Jed's. It's not, there's not much advice in it. There's a fair amount of history in it though. Um, so uh, let me just mute my, uh, before I start, I should stop my emails from making noises. Um, so uh, yes, I have been investigating psychosocial interventions for people with dementia and their family members for more than 30 years. Um, and my interest started because my mother had dementia um, <clears throat> and my family uh, really didn't know how to support each other or my father who was the primary caregiver. And so after she died, I thought I would try to figure out if there was a way for other families to, um, to have a better experience of, of caring, caregiving. So the, uh, the burden of care for people with dementia is huge. The financial burden, this was a, nine, a 2015 figure, uh, was um, estimated to be 818 billion US dollars. But what's really important is that the informal care costs account for about 40% of that. And caregivers, as you all know, spend many hours caring for people with dementia. Statistics say that they spend about 22 hours a week, but I don't know how anyone can estimate that because anyone who is or has been a caregiver knows that you never really forget about your caregiving role. It's a 24 hour a day problem. But the unpaid care in the United States provided by families and friends is estimated to be $234 billion in 2019 assuming that the annual, that the hourly rate was $12.64 an hour. So the cost, the financial cost of caregiving is absolutely huge. As we all know, unfortunately, this slide could have been made 30 years ago. There is currently no drug to reverse or halt the progression of the disease. And the well-being of people with dementia depends on the care, their caregiver's well-being. But family caregivers are at a very high risk of stress, depression, and physical illness. Almost 60% rate their emotional stress as high, 30 40 to 40% 40 suffer from depression. They're more likely than other caregivers to say their health is fair or poor. Uh, even though they often, many of them started the care, their caregiving careers with health better than average for their age. They're more likely than other care, than other caregivers of people with other diseases to have high levels of stress hormones, reduced immune function, and other indicators of, of physical stress of caregiving. More than half report financial stress, uh, more than half report family conflict, and as I said, the physical and emotional impact of caregiving is estimated to result in almost $12 billion in increased healthcare costs. But when you try to think about how to help caregivers, the first thing that the people I approached who I wanted to figure out how to help caregivers with told me was that caregivers differ in many ways. In fact, when I went to meet the people who were volunteering at the time at NYU and I said, I want to write a grant proposal, I'd love you to tell me what the theme is, what do caregivers have in common? And they said nothing. And they said, what do you mean nothing? And I, they said, well, nothing. The caregivers differ in demographics, gender, age, race, ethnicity, the availability of other family members, cultural characteristics, cultural norms about caregiving, how, how, how the culture views involvement of other family members. I remember someone telling me that in the Caribbean, uh, the whole, it becomes a whole family's problem. There is no one caregiver. 
Um, in, in New York City, it generally is one caregiver, hopefully with the help of other family members. A caregiver who is an adult child caregiver is very different from a spouse caregiver, both in experience with the person and in their uh, sense of responsibility, whether they're living with the person or not. Many caregivers have other roles. They have work. They have other family members who also need care. Some of them are going to school. Some of them are living with the person with dementia and some are caring for the person in someone else's home or in residential care. So yeah, those clinicians I approached back in 1985 were right. Caregivers differ in many ways. Um, so there are different kinds of psychosocial interventions for caregivers. Uh, Jed really sort of went over all of them. They're all provided by uh, quite a few organizations now. Um, there's education, there's support, there are strategies for improving coping, there's skills training, there are formal services like daycare in, under other circumstances than today. Um, there are multi-component interventions and there are interventions that include the person with dementia with the family caregiver. And I'm going to go over a little bit about the ones that we have um, tested here at NYU. Now, what made us think counseling and support would work? When I started in 1985 um, on this journey, uh, I was, I met four women, as I said, at NYU who had been doing what they, as clinicians, they were social workers or psychologists, counselors, what they thought uh, would be helpful. But in 1990, uh, a, a man named Leonard Perlin, who was a sociologist, published the stress process model. And this is a simplified uh, version of it. What it basically says is the things on the left of the screen the patient's dementia and the background characteristics of the person with dementia and the family members, the ones that I mentioned in the previous slide, um, cannot be changed. And they, under certain circumstances, can cause caregiver depression and nursing home placement, among other outcomes. But there are things that can be done. And Leonard Perlin hypothesized two things, support and appraisal. So support is what all our interventions at NYU have been about and elsewhere as well, uh, the ones that Caring Kind does as well. Um, and appraisal is how do you view or understand the illness? So for example, back to my own personal story, my father was absolutely convinced that my mother could do better if she tried. He never really understood, fully accepted that she had an illness. So his reaction to her symptoms was based on his understanding. That's what appraisal means. Um, so the, when I talked to these, the people at NYU, the clinicians who were there before me, uh, and we div I, I wanted to find out whether what they had already been doing at NYU as uh, sort of their clinical intuitions could really help caregivers. Um, the first thing I realized from the argument that lasted three hours is that the intervention had to be individualized to the needs of each family because every family is different. It's also a multi-component intervention that includes counseling, support, and education. What's unique about the NYU caregiver intervention is that it emphasizes support for the family for the primary family caregiver by including not only the caregiver but other family members as well. It's available when needed and as long as needed and it's geared to the stage of dementia and the strengths and limitations of the person with dementia and the family caregivers. So we are basically in the original study we were available to caregivers for as long as they needed us and often people would come back who had come to us originally when the person was say in the early stage of dementia and when they entered a later stage of dementia the problems were different and they needed us again. So this is um, a, a graphic that shows what the NYU caregiver intervention uh, looks like. It starts with an individual assessment and intake evaluation. Then there's an individual session uh, with the primary family caregiver, who in the original study was a spouse or partner. Then there are four family counseling sessions with people who that original person, the primary caregiver, 
uh, thought were important to him or her. We didn't define what family meant, and each caregiver had a different uh, idea of who they thought were important to them. Usually they're adult children, sometimes they're siblings, sometimes they're grown grandchildren, sometimes really good friends who they thought were family. Uh, we even had one family session with 13 family members in the room, um, so we didn't limit it. After the four family sessions, there is a second individual session, and then we urged people to join support groups run by organizations like Caring Kind, uh, and we also urged them to call us whenever they needed to. That's what we called ad hoc phone calls. And we, in the study, did follow-up assessments every four months for the first year and every six months thereafter. And not only did that provide data for my data analyses, but it also provided an ongoing contact. And often the caregivers would tell us that they really appreciated our calling them to do these assessments because it gave them a chance to think about where they were then in their so-called caregiving career. We think each of the components of the intervention is important and we think the package is more than the sum of its parts. We thought individual counseling would be helpful because the counselor can tailor the treatment to the needs of each caregiver. The counseling can occur at a time and place that's convenient for the caregiver. The caregiver can establish a relationship with the counselor that makes it possible to seek further advice and support when needed. And the caregiver becomes aware of the need to involve family members in patient care, which we emphasize over and over again. We thought family counseling was really important because the fa other family members sometimes don't have the same amount of contact with the person as the person who's the primary caregiver. All the family members can understand that the person with dementia is ill in the family meetings. The family members also understand that the person with dementia is no longer a sufficient source of so social support for the caregiver. Family members learn about the needs of the primary caregiver, and the primary caregiver learns what kinds of support other family members would like to give. Uh, in addition, family members in the presence of a trained social worker or other counselor can talk objectively about their current problems. Family conflict potentially could be resolved, in most cases was at least partially resolved, and communication among family members improved. Uh, as, and also all the family members were aware of our counseling service. Support groups are also important. Caregivers can provide each other with ongoing emotionally, emotional support. Caregivers benefit from talking to others who've gone through similar experiences. Caregivers can get information about how to solve the problems they are currently facing. Often caregivers don't want to talk with their family members about some of the problems they are having either because they, they are, find it awkward or embarrassing or they just don't want them to know, um, but they're willing to talk to other people who are going through the same experience. Um, we thought that ad hoc counseling was helpful. We hadn't thought about that in the beginning, but what we learned, saw was that caregivers, um, caregivers were calling us because they knew the counselor. They were able to call when they needed, uh, when a, a symptom changed or when something else happened that they thought they needed more advice. They didn't call all that much. In fact, what was amazing, some of the counselors were very, um, surprised at how little they called, but when they did those follow-up assessments, the caregivers almost inevitably said, I was so glad I had your card and I knew I could call you if I needed to. In a crisis, there was definitely someone to call and the caregivers could receive help from someone they had already met during the individual and family counseling without leaving home. So the design of the original study was designed just like a, a drug trial. There was a treatment group and a control group. The difference was the control group got a whole lot of help from us because uh, unlike a drug trial where they, the, the person who is running the trial gives you a pill and you don't know if it's got an active ingredient in it or it's just the placebo, if you are enrolled in a psychosocial intervention like this one, in a study of it, you know perfectly well what you're getting. 
so people signed consent to participate. They knew they were going to be randomly assigned to treatment or control, but there wasn't very much difference between the treatment and the control group because I couldn't control the counselors, except for the fact that only the people in the treatment group got the family counseling sessions. That was a key reason why I think the family counseling sessions are the most important ingredient in this multi-component intervention, although not without all the other parts to sustain it. We started the study in August of 1987, and we enrolled caregivers for nine and a half years till February of 1997. Uh, people in the control group, as well as people in the treatment group, really felt that they had a lot of, got a lot of value from participating. And so we were able to follow caregivers for as long as 18 years. The dropout rate in this study was less than 5% while the person with dementia was living at home. We, we enrollment criteria included that they be spouses or partners, that they be living with the person with dementia when they entered the study, and that there be at least one close relative in the area so that they could participate in the family sessions if they were assigned to the treatment group. So over those, over though that the period that we were funded to follow these caregivers, which was 23 years, uh, we were able to demonstrate a large number of very significant and important outcomes. The NYU caregiver intervention improved the well-being of family, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of family caregivers in many ways. The most immediate result was that we improved support for the caregiver. Caregivers said they were much more satisfied with the social support they were getting from their family, largely from their family, but also their friends. Um, and they felt close to more members of their family. That happened <clears throat> within four months of their entering the study. Um, and that was the time during which the individual <coughs> and family sessions occurred. So by the four months follow up, the difference between the treatment group, which got the, the six individual and family sessions and the control group was statistically and clinically significant with the treatment group being much more satisfied with the help they were getting from family and friends, support they were getting in their from their family and friends. <coughs> we also demonstrated <coughs> as a consequence of this that the, that the people in the treatment group uh, had significantly fewer depressive symptoms <coughs> over time, while the people in the control group actually became more depressed. We demonstrated that the caregiver stress reaction to the behavior of the person with dementia went down and stayed down for as long as we measured it in the people who received our, our intervention. We also demonstrated improved caregiver health and that we found that the symptom, the reduced caregiver depressive symptoms lasted as even through the trans, sorry, sorry, transition to a nursing home of the, when, it, when it happened. The mediator, the thing that interfered, the thing in that diagram I showed you before, what was called a mediator, the thing that got in the way of bad outcomes for all the other outcomes was the improvement in social support. That was proved with a statistical analysis that we published. And again, fewer than 5% of the families dropped out of the study while the person was living at home, I think because they, even the people in the control group got so much help. This is a graph of the difference between the treatment and control group in time to nursing home placement. The green line represents the treatment group. The red line represents the control group. This is an, over an 11 and a half year period. And you can see that the difference between the treatment group and the control group gets larger and larger over time. And the median or the time to, to till half the people in the treatment group uh, entered nursing homes was a year and a half less than the time for the control group. The control group, the, the control group entered nursing homes much earlier than the people in the treatment group. On average, a year and a half of nursing home placement time was postponed. So that was the thing that caught the eye of the funders because that translates into dollars. 
And we were able to demonstrate in a mathematical model that was done by colleagues of mine, that if in the state of Minnesota, which has a population of five and a half million people, so about half the population of New York City, if everyone in the state of Minnesota, every caregiver, um, got the NYU caregiver intervention, the state of Minnesota would save $996 million in 15 years. And this is largely due to uh, the, the difference in nursing time to nursing home placement. And that was, as you can see, in 2011 dollars. So I'm sure that the number is really much larger. So what are, having all these results and, and some of them actually making perhaps a policy difference uh, in care and many of these so the things that make up the NYU caregiver intervention are now um, provided by many organizations. Um, our next, the next step for me was to make sure that other people knew about it so they could do it. Um, so we replicated the, this first study in many other communities. We provided the intervention in community, community settings. We expanded the study to adult child caregivers, that is children of people with dementia, and demonstrated similar effects to the original study. Uh, we developed and evaluated training in the intervention for providers. First, we published a book, and then we developed online training and certification, which is now available so that pe other people can learn to provide this intervention uh, effectively. We developed a teleconferencing version of the NYU caregiver intervention, which is particularly relevant now. So people can, um, can be in the same room with a, a certified and trained counselor, even though they're geographically very different. And we've used the social support paradigm we developed uh, that, we, that was so effective for the NYU caregiver intervention for other interventions. And um, I've been told that the funding from New York State uh, to provide the supportive services for family caregivers that organizations like PSS, Sunnyside, and NYU now have uh, was based on the evidence from this study. Um, over time, we've enrolled more than 1,500 people in community um, studies of the end, community replications of the intervention, plus more than 500 in new randomized control trial that demonstrated similar outcomes. Um, but we've, in about 2003, I started thinking about the people in the early stage of dementia and how we'd really been leaving them out of our of our thought process. And so the first thing I did in that regard was to get a, uh, a, a Zenith uh, Fellowship Award from the Alzheimer's Association to study a couples counseling intervention we developed. We also evaluated the Meet Me at MoMA program and demonstrated its effectiveness for people with dementia together with the caregiver. And I founded a chorus in 2011. And I want to briefly describe a few of these interventions. First, the couples counseling intervention, where we focused on the couple as a unit when the person with dementia was still in the mild stage. And it provided a, a supportive environment in which the couple, together with a trained counselor, could share their emotional reactions to the diagnosis and help their address, and them address their current reactions and consider future plans and needs. Uh, it included six counseling sessions for each couple within a two-month period, plus the availability of what we called ad hoc counseling. They could call the counselor when they needed to. It was run as a randomized weightless control trial, which meant that um, some people got the intervention immediately and some people got it four months later. And we were able to demonstrate a significant improvement in the relationships between the members of the couple which was maintained for at least two months after the intervention ended. Uh, and we also found something we weren't actually planning on measuring, but we found that with no exceptions that I can remember, every caregiver said that there was improved communication between him or her and the partner. And what they said was that they never realized they stopped thinking about the person as being able to contribute to a conversation 
But in a, an environment with a counselor who was able to treat them as equals, the person with dementia was able to um, participate more fully. And that was a lesson that these caregivers were able to take home. Now, um, lastly, I want to talk about the Unforgettables, which is a chorus for people with dementia with their family members. Um, and we started that because back in 2011, there were few pleasurable activities available for these people. And we observed that participating together in the museum program, the Meet Me at MoMA program, which is now available in many, many museums around the world, in New York City as well, um, we observed that it had positive effects on both people with dementia and their family members. And we thought that a music-based program might yield even greater benefits. And the chorus provides an opportunity for people in the early and moderate stages of dementia and their family members to share a stimulating uh, social and social activity that it can improve their quality of life. And back then in 2011, there were no rigorous studies of participating in musical activities for people with dementia together with their family members. And I really started this as another way to provide social support for family caregivers. I didn't know what was going to happen with the people with dementia, and I was certainly pleasantly surprised. In, in order to enter the study, um, which was originally, there was a study, a pilot study, uh, people with dementia had to be in the early or early middle stage of, of dementia, and they had to have a caregiver or family member who was committing was committed to ent attend all of the rehearsals and the concerts. So this was meant to be for both of them. And we didn't want people to deposit their a person with dementia and walk away. We wanted it to be a pleasant and stimulating experience for both the caregiver and the person with dementia. And uh, I did an analysis of the first 10 couples who participated which was published uh, in uh, International Psychogeriatrics in 2018. And we were basically able to show that the effects on the, there were significant large effects on the, um, pers on the caregivers, which we were hoping for, um, especially on self-esteem with, uh, with the caregivers. It's a very, very small sample. So the caregivers were less depressed and had better self-esteem but the size of the effects were very large. And we think if we'd have done a larger study, all of these outcomes would have been significant. Um, but what was really pleasant, pleasant surprise was we had more effects on the, on the person with dementia than on the caregiver. Now this is a small study, but in this study, the quality of life based on two different measures and their communication with, uh, um, with the caregiver uh, went up significantly for the person with dementia. We also uh, observed that participants attended rehearsals in spite of really harsh weather conditions. I mean, we finally got permission from the IRB at NYU to start the study in June, and the first the first rehearsal was uh, was great, and then the next rehearsal, which was a week later, it was 104 degrees and I thought no one would show up. So I showed up and it turned out every other couple showed up too. Um, then the next rehearsal after that it was, it was hail and wind and rain. And I thought, oops, I better show up. No one will be there. And everybody came to that one too. People were attended rehearsals no matter what, basically. I also learned that people in the middle stage as well as the early stage enjoyed themselves and learned from the experience, even though they couldn't respond to the questionnaires. Participants were so eager to continue that they've been contributing to its cost since the pilot study ended in September 2011. We now have two choruses rehearsing because it got so large. There's one in St. Peter's Church on Lexington Avenue, and there's one in St. Michael's Church on Amsterdam and, two, and, and um, 99th Street. Uh, caregivers and people with dementia from all cultures and ba backgrounds can support each other and bring joy to the community. Um, actually, they're now rehearsing, I've been told by the conductor, they're now rehearsing via Zoom. Um, and this, all of this led to the NYU Lango and Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Family Support Program, uh, which is funded by New York State, along with PSS and Sunnyside to provide uh, comprehensive counseling and support to 
dementia caregivers in New York City. It includes all of the elements of the NYU caregiver intervention and the other, and the other interventions we've, we've found are important. Uh, and it also has unique features, a buddy program for people with dementia who mentor students in the various schools at NYU, and a place for us, which is a community program for people in the early stage of dementia that provides respite for the caregivers and is a wonderful arts experience. The recreation therapist who runs it is also an artist. Support, supportive workshops and music creative writing and weaving for caregivers. And thanks to the grant from New York State, it's at no cost to families. Um, oops. So in conclusion, uh, some thoughts about the implication of this work. I think the public and the medical profession should reframe the meaning of care and dementia. In our culture, treatment of the sick is the job of physicians and other medical professions, but a more holistic approach has demonstrated benefits in dementia. I think social support is essential and that dementia is one example, but what we have learned can be useful for treatment of almost all diseases, even when there are no available drugs. And uh, I sort of, this I wrote down a, a couple of years ago, and I, I think it's worth thinking about. What does it say about us as a society if we're not prepared to support the family so that it can care for the members, their members as, as they age? The ability of a spouse to care for his or her partner is often enhanced by the contribution of their adult children. These adults, often in midlife, are torn by the conflicting needs of parents, children, their own spouses, and their own personal aspirations. Thus, the impact of the disease trickles down to all members of the family. It's not likely that any family will be exempt from the role of caregiving, and we need to find ways to provide the kind of help that was found to be so effective in the NYU caregiver intervention study to all the family caregivers who need it. We need to find a mechanism for paying for care at home that doesn't drain the family resources. The challenge is to convince those who provide and pay for health care of the value of counseling and support for family caregivers. Uh, if you want to learn more about the Family Support Program, this is the contact information. You can email me and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Middleman. Um, we have a few questions, but I, I'm thinking we should just go and um, to the presentation with um, Dr. Saja, then we'll take the question at the end. Yes, because I'm a little behind now. Yes. So you can share your screen now. You yes, possibly. I'll pull it up. Perfect. Okay, let me just get it on slideshow. Okay, can we see it now? Yes. Okay, everyone, uh, good afternoon, and thanks for hanging in there to, to um, hear from me uh, after my, <coughs> my esteemed colleagues. Um, I'm gonna talk about the role of technology in supporting family caregivers, and which I think is a very germane today, uh, given the COVID-19, as you'll see. We've been able to carry on some of our programs uh, from Wild Cornell Medicine because we use technology to deliver our interventions. And I wanna thank, of course, my funders over the years, the National Institutes on Aging, Nursing Research, the Langloff Foundation, and AT&T. So what I'll do is talk a little bit, not a lot, because my colleagues have already done this and I don't wanna be redundant, um, about aging, cognition, and family caregiving. More importantly, I'll stress how technology can support family caregivers, um, and I'll talk about some research we're doing. Uh, my programs are joint at the University of Miami and Wild Cornell Medicine. Um, before becoming a professor and director of the Center on Aging and Behavioral Research at Wild Cornell, I was a professor and uh, director of the Center on Aging at the University um, Miller School of Medicine. I moved about 18 months ago. So some of the programs we had already started, so now we're doing them at both sites, which is great because it gives us um, more, even more diversity in our sample. 
Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges we've encountered associated with the, these interventions. And then if we have time, talk about some needed research uh, in this area. So I think just as some background, and this is even more cogent today, I believe, um, there's a change in healthcare dynamics. We're moving towards a more partnership model of care where people are supposed to become an extension of the healthcare system, a partner with their physician. And there's a trend for more care being provided at home. And of course, with the aging population, there's an increased reliance on family members to provide this needed care and support. Right now, a lot of people are providing care for an older adult. As Mary and Jed said, many of these are providing care for someone with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. Also, as both of my colleagues mentioned, caregivers are very, very diverse. They vary on a number of dimensions in addition to um, sociodemographic dimensions. What's the relationship to the care recipient? Is it a daughter? Is it just a partner? Um, what's the nature of caregiving? This depends clearly on um, what other support is available and the conditions of the person they're providing care for. What's their level of skill? And what's the motivation? Do they have a choice? Uh, most caregivers do not. Uh, and then, um, of course, the health and needs of family caregivers are often overlooked. So the landscape of caregiving is changing. We know this. We have traditionally it been mostly females in the caregiving role. We now see an increased number of male caregivers. Uh, with the population becoming more diverse, our caregivers are also becoming more diverse. The intensity and the duration of caregiving is <clears throat> also increasing in many cases as we're now uh, able to live longer with chronic conditions due to advances in medical treatments. And caregiving in many cases is also becoming more complex. I just want to talk to you a little bit more about what kind of things do caregivers do? Of course, this varies over the course of the caregiving trajectory. Where are they in the trajectory? Are, are they just, for example, taking care of someone who has a mild cognitive impairment or beginning stages of dementia? Or are they caring for someone who's in the moderate, more moderate stage? Is this an acute uh, condition? Is it a chronic condition? Uh, and they also vary according to the caregiving situation. But as you can see, caregivers do lots of things. One thing that they do, which is often very, very challenging, is, is get involved in care coordination, where they're coordinating care for their loved one and sometimes also for themselves, especially uh, caregivers who are themselves older. This can involve primary care, specialist care, therapists of varying sorts, and also trying to uh, wade through all the complications of insurance. Is this covered? If I get an aid in for this many hours a day, if I buy this piece of equipment, will this be covered? How do I make a claim? This is very overwhelming for a lot of people. Many caregivers have to be engaged in personal care care, where they're helping their loved one with bathing, with eating, uh, tasks like dressing. Uh, household tasks. Uh, this may be a daughter doing this for their parent. Now they've taken over, for example, managing the parent's finances as well as their own finances. Now, and, and I'm going to show another slide about this, um, what's changing is that many, because of this shift in the way we're doing delivering health care, many caregivers are now involved in the provision of medical or nursing tasks, like operating medical equipment, wound care, managing medications. In the past, these kinds of tasks were done by skilled professionals, and now many of them are falling on family caregivers. And finally, a lot of caregivers provide emotional, cognitive, and behavioral support. They manage things like wandering, which Jed talked about, behavioral agitation, helping their loved one with or their the person they're providing care one with uh, feelings of depression or being over isolated. So as you can see, the role of a caregiver is ongoing and it's also, uh, it's very varied and caregivers actually are um, a prime example of multitaskers at the highest level. 
if we think about how I want to go back to this whole thing about um, caregivers increasingly needing to interact with medical technology when, they, when they're providing care. This so can be something like injection equipment, a feeding tube, a blood glucose monitor, or even a personal health record, or maybe a telehealth visit, especially in today with this COVID, COVID uh, crisis. Now, a lot of these technologies are complex. People don't necessarily have enough training to use them. And um, they weren't necessarily designed so that they're easy to use. So what happens? What do we know about caregiving? Uh, Mary and Jed also talked about this, uh, go over this quickly. One thing I wanna stress is that caregivers can experience positive outcomes. They can experience some personal growth or feel like I'm giving back to someone who took care of me at some point in my life. Of course, there are also negative consequences such as depression, uh, using more prescription medications, disruption in sleep. Many caregivers don't take care of their own health because they're so involved in the care of their loved one and they become themselves at risk for physical illnesses. And there are disruptions in employment, in family and in social relationships. So because of this, over the years, there's been a lot of research done. We've done some, Mary's done some, Jed has done some. Um, uh, studies looking as, as many other colleagues across the country and the world, actually. A lot of studies done at looking at how can we help caregivers? Um, what can we do to help caregivers? And Mary all already talked about, there's a variety of approaches, non-pharmacological that have been tried skill building, education, support groups, and we find that most of the time uh, these interventions can help. They can relieve caregiver burden and depression. They can certainly enhance caregiving skills, feelings of well-being and social support, but unfortunately, even today, many caregivers uh, do not have access to or take advantage of existing programs and resources. They don't know that they're available. Uh, you heard about some today from Mary's program, from Jed's program in New York City. Um, they don't know, of, many people don't know these programs are available. That's why these uh, webinars uh, like we're participating in today are so uh, uh, helpful. Or they, they can't access community programs because they have limited mobility, transportation, or simply no one to uh, provide care for their the person, the care recipient, if they're not there. So um, a lot of things that have happened have focused on caregivers in the uh, later stages of the directory. There's also treatment approaches being directed at the person with uh, dementia, which makes sense. Uh, most interventions uh, only target one member of the dyad. And what I wanna focus on uh, is something we've been looking at for quite some time, starting when I was at the University of Miami and involved in REACH, REACH program, the National Caregiver Intervention Program, is how can we use uh, technology to bring programs and services to people? And this is becoming increasingly more popular as more people have access to technology. And also uh, in times like this, I think it's something we really need to consider Overall, the studies have, that have been done found that this is feasible, we can do it. We can put a program on a laptop and bring it to a caregiver in their home. Caregivers seem to like it and we seem to get good results with these types of interventions, even though they're not delivered in person. So how can technology help? What's the potential role of technology and what are some applications? Well, certainly technology can facilitate access to healthcare professionals, other caregivers. It provides a lot of access to information and services. For example, there are online support groups, there are telemedicine application, lots of informational websites. Some are good, some aren't so good. Um, there are sensing and monitoring systems. Uh, Ned alluded to one that he, he uh, can help people access to help a monitor if their loved one wanders. There are simple reminder systems. And then of course, uh, tech, uh, intervention programs that are delivered over technology. Uh, here we can see, for example, uh, an older woman who's likely communicating with a loved one. 
Um, there's a GPS system that monitors someone's location, a telemedicine application, simple reminder uh, systems on a smartphone, and more and more of these applications are starting to become available. Here's some example of some very nice uh, caregiver websites, one from the Alzheimer's Association and from the Caregiver Family Caregiver Alliance, and there are others available. In fact, many caregivers are using the internet to go online to access information. This is some data from the Pew uh, American, uh, the Pew Research Group uh, that was asking caregivers if they went online. And those who do uh, go online to get health information and also to get support from family or friends. You can see that about 70% say that they do that. So this is becoming more and more popular. So some of the advantages of technology, certainly it helps eliminate logistic uh, problems for not only for caregivers, but also for patients and healthcare providers. Um, we have a close friend uh, who has a wife in later stage dementia. She needed some surgery today. And I just uh, heard from my husband that uh, her spouse, our friend Irv said, this was one of the most difficult days of 24, most difficult 24 hours of his life, trying to get Joan ready and get her transported to the hospital to have the necessary services. Um, certainly uh, this helps with access. Technology can help with the access, not only to other caregivers, but to long distance family members and friends. Many family members are geographically dispersed today and things like Zoom, like we're doing now, uh, a Skype, can help family members uh, stay connected. So I want to talk about some of the projects that we've been involved with over the years. I'm going to start very briefly with video care. This was our first, really after REACH, the first time we dipped our toe in this water. And we were really thinking about, can we put a version of the evidence-based REACH program on, a, on technology and deliver it to caregivers of Alzheimer's patients, uh, Hispanic, African-American, and Haitian. I was in Miami at the time. Would it be feasible? Would it be acceptable? Would caregivers like it? And would it make a difference in terms of caregiver outcomes? So this is what we use. Don't laugh at the technology at the time it was considered um, new. This is a sc screen phone. It was developed by Cisco for uh, business applications. We chose this because it allowed us to put video and audio um, information. It, it allowed both at the time to do that on a computer was cumbersome. And also it operated like a telephone, which much, most people were familiar with. Um, our intervention included video counseling sessions one-on-one. -on -one. We actually ran video support groups. We had educational seminars. We had caregiving tips, conferencing. Family members could conference with each other. We had reminders. And we programmed this whole system in three languages, English, Spanish, and Creole. And we actually put the system in caregivers' home and um, and evaluated it in a, in, a, in a trial where we compared it to a couple of other conditions. Uh, this is an example for, of a caregiver support group. Yeah, you may recognize some of these characters, Mary. Uh, there's Dr. Eisdorfer, Dr. Lowenstein. These were colleagues of mine at the University of Miami. They were not actual caregivers, but this is what an online support group looked like on the video phone. And this was very neat because like Zoom, the person who was talking, even back then we got that picture, that picture, person's picture to be in the center of the screen so people could start to um, associate names and voices. Um, and this is what we found. It's published if you want to read it. Um, we actually had very nice findings. Caregivers who received the intervention said they were less burdened. They felt better about being a caregiver. And that's important because feeling better about being a caregiver really is uh, important with respect to caregivers' depression, feelings of burden. Uh, they also felt a significant and increase in social support. They felt that they had more social support from the intervention. They liked the, the 
video phone. They love the um, educational uh, videos. And the thing I think they liked the most were the support groups. They thought they were very valuable. They learned a lot and easy to attend. So we were encouraged um, and we just finished another study. I don't, I can only have some preliminary data uh, called Caring for the Caregiver Network. This was funded by the National Institutes on Age, uh, Nursing Research. And again, we are looking at a technology-based intervention. We upped the intervention a little in terms of its components. Um, and we really were interested in developing an effective treatment program that could improve the quality of life for caregivers, enhance their skills and uh, access to both formal and informal support. So as you can see, if you work in this space, one thing I wanna warn you is you've gotta keep up with technology, okay? So at this time, uh, the um, caregiver program was delivered over a laptop I just, as I indicated, we just finished this about a year ago. We used a Dell laptop. Uh, we gave all of our caregivers, this was a randomized control trial. We did have a control group. People in the control group also got a laptop. We gave them a wellness intervention as opposed to a caregiver intervention. We also um, provided uh, access to the internet uh, for our caregivers. And I just wanna comment on that. Uh, we have this assumption that everybody has access, has internet in their homes. Well, we learned a lesson here. Not everyone does have internet access in their homes, especially um, pe some people in the poorer neighborhoods in Miami. So we had to actually go and provide, pay off phone bills for some folks before we could even get internet access installed for them. So that's how we did it at the time. Uh, you can see the little internet thing at the bottom the USB. Um, that's not the home screen, but this is another um, caregiver support group. Uh, you can see it being led by uh, my colleague, Danny Jimenez uh, at the University of Miami. These were caregivers in their home. Uh, these were the components of the intervention. We did have two home visits, one in the beginning, so we could train people on how to use the system and get them engaged. Then we had individual skill building sessions, the support groups, like you can see. In this one, we also had a blog where caregivers could chat with each other. Uh, we're just analyzing that data now, so I'll let you know uh, maybe next time what our findings were. Um, and I will say that we collected real-time data on everything, what the people used on the system. Did they participate in the support groups? Did they look at the tips of the week? Did they look at the uh, care, um, the the videos. And um, this again was in English and Spanish. Our sample was 242 caregivers. They were split uh, ethnically, not, um, not equally across the ethnic groups, but we did have great ethnic diversion. Uh, as I said earlier, most of them, most of our caregivers were female, uh, about half, um, a little less than half were um, spouses, the rest were other relatives, mostly children. Uh, and here's our, the, um, they had uh, levels of depression um, and our care recipients here were fairly impaired. These were caregivers taking care of Alzheimer's patients who were experiencing moderate or severe Alzheimer's. So what did we find? Uh, again, we're very excited about our findings. These have not been published yet. We had a significant decrease in burden, in depression, in uh, reported negative uh, social interactions, uh, increase in social support. And again, what caregivers liked uh, were the online support group sessions. They really found them to be valuable. And in fact, uh, wanted us to increase them during the course of the intervention. Um, here's some quotes from our caregivers um, and um, you can see the first one is alluding to the support group. Um, the other one was uh, that they felt more effective as a caregiver. They felt that people were, uh, they felt they got more compassion, more understanding. So we had very, very positive interactions. So where are we now? Uh, we have rolled out a new program. And this program we are actively recruiting for, uh, not only uh, at 
in New York City, across all five boroughs. Um, we are not uh, just recruiting near Weill Cornell Medicine. We're in the Bronx, we're in Harlem, we're um, in Queens, we're in Staten, we're everywhere. Um, and again, we're looking at a technology-based intervention. It's funded by the NIH. Um, this intervention, uh, and we're excited about this now, especially in the COVID trial, because we have people who are actively enrolled in the trial. And what we've able to, been able to do is modify our protocol so that we can even provide more support to caregivers right now who are at home. Um, so the intervention is delivered at home. There's three components to it. There's a component, it's a dietic intervention. So there's a component for our caregiver based on an evidence-based program. A patient component, this is for patients with early stage uh, dementia. And a joint component, things that folks do together. We have uh, video conferencing skill building sessions. These are individual sessions between one of our interventionists and a caregiver. They're done virtually online. Uh, we have a blog where caregivers can chat to each other. We have educational and skill building videos and these we are finding to be very valuable right now. For example, we have a video on, two, several videos on relaxation uh, techniques that people can do. And we have videos on nutrition, wellness, on meditation. We also have pleasant event videos, which I think is very neat. We have Miami-centric videos that they're using in Miami, but here we have New York-centric videos. And these are all, by the way, placed in a library, so people can watch them as, as much as they choose. They can watch them together. They can watch them individually. Our pleasant events videos include a virtual tour of the New York Botanical Garden, of the Reuven Art Museum, of the Intrepid, um, and we have a video about music um, that uh, actually my nephew made because he's a musician, um, and everything is in English and in Spanish. Um, for the care recipient, there are cognitive exercises that are online. Um, we also have an organizational tool that we developed for the care recipient to help them with reminders of important events, of notes, of um, <clears throat> birthdays. People really love this organizational tool because they personalize it. It's a very personalized tool. And we have video conferencing support groups. Uh, here's the home screen. And again, the technology has uh, changed. Um, we give people the technology, they get to keep the technology after the program is over and we, uh, it's a 12 month program and we pay for their internet while they're in the program and for each of three assessments. So this is what the homepage looks like. Um, you can see it gives date and time. There's a tip of the week every, there's beautiful pictures. And then these are the various features and they access the features just simply click click on them once. It's a very simple program to use. Um, this is a study design. Let me go through this. The caregiver component, um, we focus here on early stage caregivers, caregivers who are just uh, taking care of people with early stage dementia. What we're trying to do is prepare the caregiver and help them transition uh, through the various stages of caregiving and to the caregiver role. Of course, we're trying to prevent caregiver distress and it is multi-component. I've already talked about the care recipient component. And then the integrated component are things that the, the caregiver and care recipient do together. They work on communication, stress management, uh, how to engage in pleasant events, uh, focusing on something other than the disease, and on strategies to enhance well-being. Again, here's the home page. Um, this shows you. Uh, this is. Um, you know, let's go back to the home page. So, if you clicked on topics, either this is a current or a session topic. This one was on stress management, and you see this builds up in the caregivers' library. There are skill building videos, deep breathing, meditation muscle relaxation, there's tips, there's learning all about stress, how to manage stress. So it's a very uh, full intervention and people can keep going back to these things, which is probably really important right now. 
Um, then there's material on memory loss, lots of things. Uh, also uh, on community resources. As I said, we're trying to connect people with resources that are already out there. So Mary, Dr. Middleman's res resources are on that list. Uh, Karen Kind's resources are on that list. What we see this program is, is complementary to those programs. So people know that they're there. They know they can access them. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry, I'm talking about technology and I can't even use it. This is just another screenshot. Um, and here is our, one of our recruitment ads. We have them, they're culturally tailored um, and uh, they're also in English and Spanish. Uh, another program I just want to talk about very quickly because I have, I think, one minute left is our PRISM program. Uh, in a larger study, we designed a software system. It's on a tablet. We give the people the tablet and the internet. And it's designed to support social connectivity and engagement, new learning, and help prospective memory, which is remembering how to do things, remembering when to do things, when to take your meds, when you have a doctor's appointment. We got us, this is uh, being evaluated in a large multi site study. The system, it's the second version. We had big success with the first. Uh, but we just got a, a supplement from the NIH to test it out with adult. For, uh, with the adults with MCI. So we've simplified the system to include these features um, and we are also actively recruiting for this project right now. Um, and again, we were able to modify the program so that people who are in the program were, were contacting them more, um, were uh, explaining, uh, encouraging them more to use things like email, like the internet. Um, we've added um, resources and the internet rel uh, related to the COVID virus resources. So those are, um, I, again, I'm going backwards. Those are some of the programs that we have to offer. Some of the challenges that we've encountered, I've already talked about one, lack of internet access. Uh, this is still true, especially in, in places like rural locations or uh, in some of the lower socioeconomic neighborhoods. Some people don't have the technology skills. We spend a lot of time designing these systems so that they're very easy to use, cost. Um, and uh, some people have concerns about privacy and security, which are well-founded, but I just want to assure you that all of our programs are um, very secure and there's a fire around, wall around all of them with the, uh, that the IT at Weill Cornell Medicine has developed. So let me skip this. Um, in conclusion, I think that um, we need a lot more research in this area of technology-based interventions. We also have to start thinking about cost effectiveness. What type of applications uh, best meet caregiver and care recipient needs? Uh, how do we best integrate these technology uh, interventions with routine clinical practice? And also, what are some, what do caregivers want? What kind of technology would work best for a particular caregiver? What kind of format would they like to be able to monitor their loved one? We really strongly believe that, as Mary, Dr. Middleman said, these approaches need to be tailored. They need to be uh, individualized as um, one shoe does not fit everyone. So um, thank you. Here's uh, how you can get a hold of us. That's our recruitment line. Uh, so if you're interested in the, the studies that I mentioned, please call us at that number. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, doctor. Thank you, everyone. Um, for participating and thank you for all our panelists. We do have some questions. Um, so we're going to, uh, I don't know if um, Dr. Middleman, can you hear me? Hear me? Oh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, um, the, I think the, the first question, it's, um, it's they, they had it when you were present, the, 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 the person added it when you were presenting. Um, so can you see it? in the Q&A box. About the mother with, with dementia and the changes? Yes. Hmm. It says it's been two years I, since I can read mom... it. I can oh, read okay. it. I'm trying to think how I could answer it. 
So I was waiting for everybody to hear it. Um, I think mm-hmm. I think actually anyone on the panel, maybe Jed, you want it? Yeah, I can. Um, let me let me unmute. Hold on a second. Yeah, you are on mute right now. Oh, I am. Okay, good. Thank you. You know, um, I think. Let me let me just read the question for everybody to know. Okay, what go the ahead. Is. It's been two years since my mom has been diagnosed with dementia, and I can definitely see the changes in her. As a caregiver, I can I can be a bit overbearing by watching over her, asking her to wash her hands, and generally practicing good hygiene. However, she's becoming more stubborn and often refuses, refuses to certain things. I don't want to physically impose myself on her. So how do I go about this situation of, of refusal? Uh, it's not an unusual situation, I think, for, for um, where the person with dementia is, is feel, feels like they are uncooperative or they're stubborn or they are... Um, uh, you know, not cooperating. And um, so one, I would, I would uh, generally suggest that you sign up for our family caregiver workshop because we go into a great deal of detail and uh, providing skills about how to manage those kinds of situations. But as a general principle, I would say, one, pick your battles um, and that um, getting some hygiene done is better than getting it all done. Uh, I remember a nurse once telling me that nobody ever died because she didn't take a bath. And there are uh, alternative methods to uh, helping somebody shower or bathe, if that's the issue. Um, and um, as I said, for the, uh, for the current hand washing issue, um, sometimes you know, using a scented soaps or soaps that are um, pleasurable, people might enjoy that, or um, using hand sanitizer, which you can also find scented ones that might be uh, helpful. But I think in terms of your approach, learning to um, recognize that if you, you know, take, understand that no means no from that person with dementia, if they're confused, and you're not going to get anywhere by arguing or um, continuing the conversation, using distraction, using, um, uh, some people might use a, um, reminder, uh, a written reminder, or posting notes in the bathroom to, you know, uh, on the mirror that say, please wash your hands. Um, uh, different things work for different people. Um, and I would also say, uh, give yourself a break. It sounds very stressful. And the more you're able to kind of um, accept your own limitations, I think that that goes a long way. Mary, do you have anything to add, or Sarah? I thought that was really quite well put. I think I think the issue is often not the issue of the person with dementia, but the issue of the caregiver. And that mm-hmm. since the person with dementia is not likely to change, um, it's the caregiver who has to figure out how best to 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 react to the problem. And uh, I think often there is a sense of there's a sense of achievement in just doing that successfully. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think you can't have the expectation that everyone is going to be perfect or that you're going to be a perfect caregiver. There's no such definition of perfect in this in this situation. I think what we have to do is understand that as a caregiver, you're doing the best that you possibly can. Absolutely. Okay. Um, um, another question is, um, my father still manages his own money, but because of his dementia, he's becoming rather, rather reckless with his purchases. How do I go about taking over their finances and money from them? That's really I, hard because it, I've been told by elder law attorneys that it can take a, a, a six months before you can actually achieve that. Um, maybe I, I actually think sometimes you can convince them that it's in their own best interest to limit the size of the credit on their credit card account. Yeah, I think I think that's a very good suggestion. I would also yeah. um, think that if you can uh, make it a joint account. Um, 
And if you can have a conversation with uh, the bank manager and let them know about your, your dad's um, uh, diagnosis. Um, and so if he's going to the uh, teller and taking out a large amount of uh, large uh, amount of money regularly, which we've seen happen, uh, sometimes the financial institutions have been helpful in, in restricting that. Um, but, you know, um, short of a uh, legal proceeding or a guardianship, which is both costly and time consuming, um, you know, it's very tricky. I think one of the things that you can provide is a, um, so people still have a sense of control and that you're not taking their money away from them. Um, you know, it, and that's where the legal and financial planning comes in um, to make sure that you have power of attorney, a durable power of attorney um, over their um, finances and uh, over their personal business and um, on bank accounts and, and other, you know, stock and brokerage accounts. I would also say um, that, uh, you know, making sure that they have actual cash in there, not a lot, but something so they feel that I lose it, and often they do, but it, it at least provides some sense of uh, control and it's symbolically very important. And that the, um, and at some point you're gonna have to say, look, I can't let my dad make these decisions anymore because just like you wouldn't let a, 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 a child uh, make uh, financial decisions and not that I'm comparing a person with dementia to a child, but, but um, cognitively they might be functioning uh, at, a, at a level of, of a, a child. Um, I think it's a very tricky thing and I would uh, you know, encourage you to call any of us for uh, talk to one of our counselors um, and see if there are other suggestions. But it is, it is admittedly one of the most challenging things. Uh, equally challenging, I would say, is taking away the keys to the car. Um, yes, I, I agree. And I think the earlier that you can start having these kinds of discussions uh, with the person you're caring for, uh, the better it is, mm -hmm. where you're still able to have some degree of reasonable conversation. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And I, I like, um, I think the idea of joint accounts as a way to gradually ease into this is also an excellent suggestion because if nothing more, it allows you the opportunity to monitor uh, what, is, what is going on. So if you see something unusual, you can put a stop to it. Right. Okay, Dr. Melman, there's a question for um, for you. The third question, I mean the second question. Yeah. So Carolyn Help and Healy asked um, whether the individuals with the dementia were included in the family counseling sessions in the original NYU caregiver intervention when we first did it in 19 in <clears throat> when we first did it the family uh person with dementia was not included in any part of the intervention in the um what well, that was because back then people thought that that people would rather talk about the situation when the person was not there um in later replications particularly in the community uh replications around the united states we told the uh, um the providers that if they wanted to include the person with dementia and the person was in an early enough stage to participate, it was up to the family and to the provider whether that happened. Um, but in general, uh, even though we said that we thought that was perfectly fine, it almost never happened because it was very hard to figure out how to do it. I think it's an unanswered question for us. How do you do, have family counseling uh, about a person, although I think the disabilities movement correctly says nothing about us without us, we haven't figured how to, out how to do it well yet. Um, thank you. And Dr. Saja, you have a, the, la the next question is, it's, is the NIH or open to individual only in early stage of Alzheimer's? Um, Actually, the focus of the project is for early stage memory loss um, and dementia. Um, and we have a, a screening protocol that we use uh, to see if uh, someone is in fact eligible for the program. Um, and 
We are, um, well, it is early stage. There is some flexibility around that. So it's best to call and then we can talk to you over the phone. We do the screening over the phone, so not to inter inconvenience anyone. Um, and then we can decide on eligibility. Okay, um, so any other questions? If anybody has any question, you can just add it. We have like one I think, minute. I think I see one in the chat about our support group sessions. If they were, oh yes, if yes. they're professionally facilitated, uh, yes, our support groups are um, all facilitated by one of our uh, interventionists. They're scripted. There's a very script, uh, strict protocol. Our interventionists are trained, so they are facilitated. Let me let me just add that um, you know uh, our support groups, which are not part of a research study, uh, and are available to um, you know uh, family caregivers. We are uh, still um, enrolling new, admitting new uh, participants to support groups. So um, if you're interested, call the helpline at six four six seven four four two nine hundred, and uh, we can get you that information. Yeah, I would like to add a comment. Also, I think that this is probably true of all of us. We're now providing all the services in our programs that we mm -hmm. did used to provide in person. We're now providing them all online via video conferencing or by telephone. So if mm -hmm. anybody um, needs support or help or education or a place for a person with dementia to uh, have an enjoyable activity, we at NYU have all of those. And I suspect that Caring Kind does too. Yes, we do indeed. Yes, and then it's so great that we have a lot of um, agency that providing all this um, Im important inform um, information and for the caregiver and the, and the community and the care and the family too. We also do have um, our support group also telechat. So if you anybody wants to um, join us, it's um, PSS caregivers that org you find all the information there. And also if you want to call in us, it's one eight. <clears throat> Sorry. One eight six 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 five one seven one three, and of course, um, care caring kind um, NYU and Dr. Saja has all this important information for all of us in the community. Um, if uh, I think there's a last question, it's a long question. <laughs> um, can um, I get a copy of the presentation? Um, can, I can show you the cop. I don't have the, the one for Dr. Middleman, but I do have the one for Jed. I can, Jed, can I share it or? Yes, I think um, the ones that I, uh, I'll send you a PDF of one mm -hmm. that can be shared. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll send one also if you like. Okay. I'll, I'll send one that can be shared, but some of the data uh, has to come out because they're not, it's not been published yet. Yes. yes. Um, and it will be a PDF. Yes, and also the the um, webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website. If anybody missed anything and want to go back and view some part of it, you can go and watch it. It's going to be posted in a, in a few days. Great. Okay. And we'll also put a link on ours as well. Great. To the webinar. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jed, do you want to answer the last question? Uh, which is? My husband uh, was diagnosed with mild oh, to moderate mm -hmm. dementia two years ago. In spite of two meds and enrolling him in grade program, there has been some progression. Most notable is getting very angry when he is told he's, he did something that he does remember and tells you that why I'm accusing him and he swear on his death. We all know all this part when it comes to somebody uh -huh. who has a, yeah, right? Um, five, minute, five, mi five minutes later, he asks why I'm a sad or crying, totally forget, suggests so how to best handle that situation. Yeah, I think when uh, your safety is paramount, so if you feel unsafe, you need to get to another location or another room. And because um, his, because he has short-term memory, which is very typical of, of, of uh, dementia, um, I think uh, you can use that and try not to, um, uh, if you know what his triggers are, if you know what provokes this behavior, um, kind of understand that and 
uh, use other ways of, of engaging him. Um, so don't tell him he did something that he doesn't, you know, um, and if he says he doesn't remember, then, oh, I might have made a mistake. Sorry, you didn't do it. You know, kind of um, uh, don't, uh, don't argue. Um, that's going to get him more angry or more upset. And I think that, uh, you know, and again, I would encourage you to sign up for our family caregiver workshops. Uh, we do them in English and Spanish and Mandarin, and they are really good. We'll be moving them, um, I believe, we're looking at moving them to online during the uh, COVID um, epidemic. But I think not triggering him and not um, telling him that he doesn't remember, uh, and just kind of, you know, um, distracting him and doing something that he will find pleasurable or comforting rather than um, uh, doing the doing engaging in behavior that is really hard and I, let me tell you it's very hard to do this in the moment because you are probably frustrated and exhausted and you at the end of your rope so i would say um you know i hope you're getting some support and uh you're absolutely you know uh, i encourage you to to get more support reach out to us and uh learn more techniques about how to handle this these communication um, challenges are very difficult, but your safety is paramount. You need to make sure that you feel safe. And so if he's getting violent or, or um, combative, you need to uh, move away. And then, as you said, in a moment or two, a few minutes, he might forget it uh, completely. Okay. Um, thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you, everybody for staying with us for this webinar today is in very important information. Um, thank you, Jed. Um, thank you, Dr. Middleman. Um, and also, um, Dr. Saja has to go because she has a, um, other part. Okay, this is the last question. Okay, I think, yeah, I think just, you know, call out and um, call okay. us at 646-744-2900 find out about the workshops and about uh, talking to one of our counselors. I think that, that might be helpful or one of our dementia uh, care specialists about communication. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, so thank you again and thank you everybody for staying with us today and everybody stay safe and we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you, Shana. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bye. Thank Bye you, now. been a pleasure, bye.